Hey everybody, welcome back to Countdown by Deborah Wiles, and today we will be reading chapter 16. Oh, and where'd we leave free? Her and Joe Ellen. No, excuse me, her and Margie are off to snoop. You guys ever do that? You ever snooped around somebody else's stuff? Mm -hmm. I'm watching you. Chapter 16. Mom can't refuse when I ask her in front of Mrs. Gardner. Mrs. Gardner seems relieved to unload Margie and says, I don't know how you do it, Nadine, with Phil flying all the time. Plus, I'm a nervous wreck with all this nuclear news. Everyone must be on pins and needles at Andrews. Mom doesn't divulge a scintilla of her feelings. She plasters Mrs. Gardner with a squadron wife smile and says, Phil comes home tomorrow. We're looking forward to it. And she guides Mrs. Gardner to the front door. Thank you again for the shepherd's pie, Martha. So thoughtful of you. You're welcome, says Mrs. Gardner with a tiny pout. Well, I've got to get back to the twins. They're down for a nap. And she sachets out the door. So Margie stays. Mrs. Gardner goes and mom goes back to work fixing the lawn. Half an hour, Franny, she tells me, shooting me with that bullet stare. Yes, ma'am, I say in a telegraph her. Don't come back inside for 30 minutes. I fill Margie in as we scoot down the hallway to my room. Remember that letter that Joellen got yesterday? Franny, I would need a scorecard to keep up with all that happened at your house yesterday. Right. Well, Lainey gave Joellen a letter. Oh, right, says Margie. I do remember. And Joellen has lots of letters just like this one, and she won't tell me who they're from. She keeps them locked in her hope chest. It's a big secret, and I don't know why. Do you have a key? Margie. Margie is nothing if not practical. Um, I have my diary key, I say, and my roller skate key, and there's mom's luggage key in her suitcase lock. Let's start there, Margie says. She's excited. I can hear it in her voice. If they don't work, I have keys too. It's bad enough to sneak into mom and dad's walk-in closet. I know mom can tell if someone has been been in her room, and I'm sure she'll notice her suitcase key missing as soon as she steps into the closet again. Nothing escapes her eagle eye. So I have to move like a ghost. My heart beats like a timpana drum. I'll do it myself, I tell Margie as she begins to follow me. You watch out my bedroom window for mom and tell me if she looks like she's going to come inside. Hurry, says Margie. I take a deep breath and I twinkle across the carpet in my flip flops into the closet, out of the closet, and I hold the key in my tight fist and look behind me to make sure I don't leave footprints. I can't be sure. I quickly walk to mom and dad's bedroom window and look for Drew. He's in the tree house. Jack is sleeping below him. Okay, good. I walk into the hallway and signal Margie. Let's go, I say with a big exhale. I pull my diary key from my pillowcase in my room, and soon we stand in front of Joellen's closed bedroom door. We continue to stand there and stand there. Nancy Drew would open the door, says Margie. She says it with an edge of sarcasm to her voice. Margie quit reading Nancy Drew last year. She says she's gone beyond Nancy Drew, but here she stands at Joellen's door with me, ready for a mystery. I take Chris Cabas's handkerchief out of my pants pocket and turn the doorknob. You don't have to be that dramatic, Margie whispers. No fingerprints, I whisper back. This is a top secret operation. And it feels good to flaunt Chris's handkerchief without telling Margie whose it is or how I got it. We've got a secret of my, I've got a secret of my own. <laughs> Nancy Drew would be proud. I turn the doorknob and we are in. Close it, Margie asks. I shake my head. We need to be able to make a quick exit. Margie and I kneel in front of Joellen's hope chest, the way Mary Flood kneels in front of the priest at the front of the Catholic Church. I work on the lock gingerly. I don't want to make a mark that Joellen might notice. My diary key doesn't work. My skate key is way too big to work. And I telegraph mom's luggage key to work, work, key, work. And it does. It works like it was meant to open this lock. I tingle with delight and dread as I hear the clasp turn and the lock give. Margie whispers, wow. And together we push up and open Joellen's Cedar Hope Chest. 
There are the salt shakers, the doilies, the pickle pickers, and the money pad. Excuse me, the monkey pad. Monkey pad? Monkey pod. I'm really sorry about that. And the monkey pod salad bowls. I'm going to have to look that up. I don't know what a monkey pod is. All the trappings for a new life saved in a holy place for the wife that Joellen will be someday. And as soon as she finds the picky man to match her picky woman ways, don't touch, I hiss as Margie reaches a hand toward the embroidered napkins. I don't want anything in here disturbed. It feels like we're rummaging through Joellen's tomb. And for a moment, I think, I can't do this. I can't open the drawer that has the letters in it and let Margie see them. Can I? I can. The drawer slides silently out of its cedar-lined pocket. There they are, gleaming like a crispy sea of sunshine, like the Sea of Galilee and King of Kings, the only movie I've ever gone to see by myself because no one else wanted to see it this past summer. Hurry up, snaps Nargi, and I come back to the present. Hold your horses, I say. Now comes the question. What do I take? Joellen would surely notice all of them missing. And I slip my fingers under the bottom of the pile and inch the bottom letter out of its place. And as I tug, they all come towards me. But I push the rest of the letters back into the drawer and close it. Take the top one too, you nut, says Margie, so we know the latest. No, Joellen might notice. I can't. Don't be so stupid, Franny. And Margie reaches for the drawer of letters and I push her hand away. No, Joellen might keep track of the dates or smudges. Nancy Drew would never take the top letter. You're a nitwit, Franny, says Margie, clearly irritated. And Nancy Drew is a nitwit, too. Margie, again, reaches for the letters, so I grab the top of the chest to close it. But I lose my grip, and the top bangs shut, just missing Margie's prying fingers. Franny, you're a moron. Hurry, hurry. I fight the key and the lock. I turn it right and left, left and right. I tug on it like I'm a prize fighter, but it won't come out. I turn it some more. Now I'm frantic. I've bent it. And I try to bend it back just as Margie shoots herself upright like a rocket and shouts, Drew! I accordion to the floor and sit on the letter I have pilfered. And it makes a muffled crunching sound. And the suitcase key is still on the lock behind me. And I don't know what to do. What are you doing? It's a simple question asked by a simple boy. And I need to find a simple answer. Nothing. Joellen doesn't like people in her room. I know, Drew. I was putting some napkins in her hope chest. She asked me to. I'm helping her, says Margie, not helpfully. Um, okay, says Drew. And he stares at me like mom does when she knows I'm telling a whopper. He scratches his eyebrow. Mom wants me to tell you that your half hour is up. Okay, I say, Margie's just going. I'll let, not, I'll let mom know, says Drew, and he flops down the hallway in bare feet. I slip the letter out from under my bottom. I've squished it. Anybody with half a brain can tell that it's been sat on. We've got to read it, Margie says. You've got to go home, I say as I scramble to my feet. Margie groans. How can you leave me hanging like this? I'll read it and let you know what it says, okay? I tell her. Hurry, you've got to go. Oh, no, you don't. Margie grabs the letter from my hand, races to my room, jumps on my bed, and rolls across my pink bedspread. Give it back! I try to snatch the letter from her hand, but Margie stuffs it under her shirt and won't give it to me. Stop it, Margie! Stop it, Margie! She mocks me and laughs. And then, out of nowhere, Mom appears. Francis! Mom's short, but she sounds as big as Godzilla standing in the frame of my bedroom window. I'm oh, sorry, of my bedroom door. I stand as straight as an arrow. I have perfect posture for once, and it occurs to me wildly to hope Mom notices my posture. Margie scrambles to sit up on the side of the bed. The letter is crumpled beyond all recognition, but Mom doesn't notice. She's too busy noticing that I haven't sent Margie out the door. Yes, ma'am, I say, and Margie crackles right out of my bedroom with Joellen's letter plastered against her left side so mom can't see. See you, Franny, she says. Bye, Mrs. Chapman. I've got company coming over. Gotta run. The long stare of mom is upon me. Sorry, I say. My shoulders sag. Young lady, mom starts. 
and I hear a lecture coming on, but then she falters. She's bone tired, to use mom's words. Her eyes have dark circles under them, her shoulders sag, and she looks more like Miss Maddie than mom. Wash up and come help me with supper, is all she says. My mind whirls like an out of control blender. When does Joellen come home? When can I get back into her room without being noticed? When can I get the key out of the lock? How can I return it to mom's suitcase? And the biggest whirl of all. What do I do about the fact that my sister's letter, my sister's secret, is now in Margie's hands? What would you do if somebody stole a secret that you were trying to steal? See you guys tomorrow for Chapter 17.